Nice. All right. Well, we're going to talk about all that. We're, we're live. Look at that. We're live, everybody. Welcome to Always Booking Comedy. We got Bob DeBono. I have no idea if I said that right. Did I say that you, right? You did. My, my dad never said it right. It's, it's pronounced DeBono. And my dad would introduce himself to people as, hey, I'm Bob DeBono. Hey, I'm Bob DeBono. I'm like, dad, you don't even know your own name. <laughs> Bob DeBono. Terrific. Terrific. So Bob's from New Jersey, everybody. And uh, we're going to get to know him as a comic and uh, uh, talk about some road stories and running shows and, and just have some laughs. And we'll be done in another 29 minutes. It'll be over <laughs> before you know it. So, Bob, when did you uh, get started in comedy? Yeah. So I, I started doing stand up when I was like, I did it once when I was 16 in like a church. For like, you know, and that was like my first foray into it. You know, I used to like watch Gary Shandling when I was a kid. And I was like, oh, I, I loved comedy. David Brenner, Gary Shandling. Um, I used to watch Bizarre with John Biner and all these different people like kind of influenced me. And I and I thought I was going to be, I, th I just thought I was going to be amazing, you know. And then I got on stage at this church and they were very religious. And I was up there for like 25 minutes making fun of my dad, making fun of our family. And I just, you know, they just stared at me. And I, I remember saying, like, you know, you guys, you guys can laugh, you know, you can laugh. Like, it's not a speech. Like, it's, I'm actually telling. And then, and it was so, it was, I was so young. I was 16 that I was too dumb to know that I sucked. Right. You know, like, I didn't realize I was dumb, you know. It's almost, yeah, like, I, that's why it's good. If you're, if you're kind of clueless, it's almost good in a way. Because you're not so sensitive to to the crowd, you know? Yep. Um, I always liken that to actors, like when they do comedy, because people I know that come from the acting background. First, when they do stand up, I would always notice that they would go up there and they literally, they could be bombing and it doesn't affect them. <laughs> They'll get off stage and I'm like, uh, you know, <laughs> how'd it go? You know, that usually how to go means that the person thinks you didn't do well because right yeah were, they're like well you were right there uh, <laughs> and you're like oh yeah you're right uh, but you're like oh well how do you think it went right and that's and the guy was like oh yeah it was great and you're like it was great if it was a speech right that wasn't great if you were trying to get a laugh right uh, but the actors always have that they don't care like it's it's just this great innate. At, you know, because of, they're always doing a scene. They're not waiting on that instant gratification, you know? Right. Anyway, I'm going to bring you with me where I'm going. Please, I'll go in there, okay? No, that's all right. I'm but you got to. I'm right, sorry. <laughs> all right. We're, my, my we're always booking comedy. We're always moving positions. We're, uh, we're right. she, said, she said I could stay. All right, okay. All right. We got permission. She's funnier right. than me. You want her to come on or <laughs> she's, she's a killer. I'm opening for her. Um, anyway, I started at 16 and then I didn't do it again for like 10 years. And then I started uh, in my 20s. I don't know. Yeah, maybe in my 20s or something. And um, and I, I was probably later than most. Like I was probably 29 when I started. And I was kind of um, a late bloomer in that because I had the day job in sales. And I was like many comics trying to make a living and trying to like stay afloat and then go out at night, you know, during the week and, you know, try to figure out, figure this all out. Right. Know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think, I think it's a really good point you made about self-awareness and how you almost need to not have self-awareness in the beginning to, uh, yeah, <laughs> to, and, to not quit when you're yeah. just dying. And the other thing too, is like, I mean, the, the most delusional comedians tend to go very far because they don't have any of that self-awareness to feel sensitive to not knowing whether they're good enough. Right. Most of us have a fear of failure. And so I think, so I feel yeah. like most of us are so hard on ourselves. I was the opposite. I never felt I was good enough. I'm very OCD. And I was like, Oh, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for that. And I, it was, I was so hard on myself. And then I would see people getting really great things and opportunities and they were just fearless. And a lot of it was, Maybe they got stroked a lot when they were kids and told they were amazing. I mean, I don't, I don't come from that kind of a house. Um, a very self-deprecating, broken, beaten down, miserable, bitter, you know, lifeless. That's where that's my that's where I feel comfortable. <laughs> nice, lifeless. Nice. A sticky basement bar. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's your home. So, okay. Yeah. So, how did you? Uh, 
like, so, so you were 16, you had no idea what you were doing. Yeah. And then you came back in your twenties and you probably still had no idea what you were doing. 29 was the next time I got back on stage. And now, you know, I've been doing it for, you know, I don't know, a long time. And um, I mean, I look back on that first time I watched it the other day. You know, <laughs> that was the best set I've ever had. The, you, when you were 29? 16. Oh, when you were 16. I cried. I mean, I didn't do that well. But I look back now, I'm like, I think that was the best set I've ever had. Really? Come no, on, get out of here. I'm joking. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Imagine uh, if you saw my, a clip of me when I was 16, and you're like, that's great. Let's watch a video of you now. And then it was the same exact material. That would be <laughs> hilarious. Oh, I know that comic. I know yeah, many yeah. of that comic. Yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. That's the self-awareness, the lack of self-awareness that I can't stand. The, the, if you're not self-aware and you keep plowing ahead, eventually you get good. If you, yeah, if you just yeah. keep trying and you know you're trying to get laughs and you're around comedy and you hear yeah, yeah. You know, structure and you see people who are successful, you're yeah. like, you can piece together, okay, that's what I need to do. You're and then more importantly, that's what I don't need to do. Like I, when you, I, yeah. I feel like you can even be, you don't really even have to be that funny, but it's like memorizing a speech. Like if you you're around comedy enough, you, you pick up the kind of the template uh, for what makes something funny. And then you could be the most unfunny person off stage, you know, but on yeah. stage you finally figure it out and it works, you know? Yeah. That's terrific. All right. So tell me about a booking win you had at any point could have been last weekend. It could have been when you got that church gig at 16. Like yeah. how did it, how did it happen? Why were you excited about it? You say a booking win, like a, like a really great gig. Yeah, like you got that gig. Like, how did you get the gig? What was the gig yeah. like? You know, and this is only in, in stand up, but getting a stand up, yeah, stand up somewhere. Yeah, I mean, not I, your male stripping career, just yeah, all right, Fuck, forget it. Um, I would say for me, like, um, um, I mean, doing stand up on TV, obviously, every young comic wants. I did Gotham Live on Axis, like, I think the first time I did TV doing stand up was like six years ago, seven, maybe seven years ago. And that was really exciting. Um, and I and I always say this to all comics. I mean, TV doesn't mean that, you, you know, if you, one comic can get a TV credit, another one doesn't. It doesn't make that comic funnier than the other comic. It's just opportunity. It's, you know, uh, uh, cogs in a wheel. Uh, maybe one particular booker takes a shine to you. Um, and but but as a comic, if you can get something where you can showcase your stuff, uh, it's, it's a win, you know, and, and it, when that, and it all, it all feels like it comes to fruition, you know, and I got, when I got Gotham live, that was kind of an, a, it was like years and years and years of out there doing it in the clubs. And now I'm like, Oh wow, I'm doing this live in front of a huge national audience. So and, how did that come about? Tell, tell it, us about the booker well, and what your yeah, relationship well, it was. was Gotham, and... Gotham live used to do a, um, a, a show, uh, that was weekly, on Axis TV network, which you know was a kind of a newer network, and they would show like live concerts, and it really took off like as a as a weekly live show, and and everyone loved it because it was live, it was bringing the live experience of comedy to the masses, um, and they would, um, you know, you had to you had to send in a tape, and they had to like it, and they and they would send you notes back. Um, and I just remember like going out there and working on that set over and over and over again, trying to hone it. And I remember when they called me, I had like a week cause they're like, Oh, do you want to do it next week? I'm like, huh? you know, you know, that panic where you're like, Oh my God, yeah. I'm not ready. And then I was like in Idaho doing shows. And, um, but all of that teaches you to really like learn how to format and put, you know, material together and always have something in your pocket, you know, that you're, you, you can do on an audition. Yeah. And then they liked what I did, and I went and did. I remember Carlos Mencia went up. He was the host. He was supposed to do 10 minutes. He probably did 25. He went way over. Uh, I'm in the back. I'm, like, furious. I'm like, oh, geez, here we go. Like, I got to follow that. And, you know, of course, everyone loved him because he was uh, – I mean, it was probably seven years ago. So he was still relatively popular, and people knew who he was. And, and, that, and that was the first one out of the gate. There was four comedians on the show, and I remember, like – feeling like, oh God, I got to match that. Yeah. And I remember coming out and I was overly excited. Uh, like I watch it now. I can't even watch it. Like it was, it was, I was going a hundred miles per hour. Like I, I would use it now as a learning tool to show a comic. 
don't try. It's not about more. It's about less and quality and don't try to force it all in, you know? Yeah. I just had that the other day. I, d- I did a headlining set and there were only 12 people in the audience. And I was yeah. like, I got to turn around this energy. I'm coming out like guns blazing. Yeah. And it just yeah. it did not work at all. Yeah. It was I such actually, a terrible idea. <laughs> I actually come out now actually holding a gun. <laughs> And I wave it, I wave it, blazing it. And I'm just like, listen. Yeah, that would have worked fine. This was in Wyoming. So that's totally, oh. you know, they would they would have applauded. I would have gotten the standing ovation. Are of those audiences good in Wyoming? Like I've never done I, Wyoming. So I, I wouldn't talk specifically about Wyoming, but I would say that small town audiences are by far my favorite audiences. I agree. They buy the most merch. They're the most grateful. Yes. They're so generous with laughter. And I just feel good about the craft of comedy when people are genuinely thankful for the experience, they, you know, to, yeah. the smaller the town, the closer I am to a big league, New York city or LA comedian. It doesn't matter that I'm, you know, from somewhere in Colorado, it's like, wow, this guy drove 12 hours and, and he made us laugh. We're thrilled. So yeah, I, I, I love those. When lines. people ask me where my favorite place to perform is, I don't say New York city. I mean, I, I work out in New York city, yeah. I'll, I do the seller, but my favorite audiences are always on the road in cities at clubs that I just love performing in. I used to, I love Boise, Idaho. Okay. I love doing Vegas that has a totally different energy to it doing Vegas. Mm-hmm. Um, I do the Borgata in Atlantic city and I love that. I mean, yeah. and different audiences give me something different back. And I agree, the smaller ones are the better. And these small towns, like they're so thankful that you're there. Yeah. And you're like, oh, well, of course I'm here. Like, I, I love right. this. You want an audience. I don't care. You, you, I don't know why you guys think I wouldn't be here. Right. Give me a mic and a stage and, yeah. and some there, attention. You guys can leave. I don't need you. I could just. Right. Exactly. So. Oh, man. All right. Uh, so as you were coming up, did you ever run shows or do you run shows now? Oh, yeah. So when I was newer as a comic, I to get stage time in New York City, the whole idea was to, um, you know, you had to do these shows where you promoted and invited your friends. And I, I for myself, um, I, I didn't have many friends. I'd have two or three people I'd be standing outside the club, you know, freezing like I got two. I just need one more. And the booker would come over. You need one more to get on. And you're going to do five minutes or we're going to deduct a minute. And you're just feeling like humiliated. And then I just, I remember seeing like, and this is, goes on even today in New York city and a lot of these venues, uh, the shows that they do, they'll do new talent shows and they'll put amateurs on and they have to promote it and bring so many people out, which I thought was fine. I mean, look, that's, I get it. I was in business. I was a marketing guy. Hey, you're not a pro. If you're going to bring something to the table, invite people out so we can make money. I mean, that's what rock clubs do it. Um, People do it with guest bartending where they'll have someone bartend and bring all their friends. But I just remember that the shows, the caliber of the shows was so horrible that I would just be on a show that would be three and a half hours, 20 amateurs. So I decided to create my own show with a friend of mine called Character Flawed. And the whole idea of the show was the crux of it was let's create a show that's a pro show. And we'll put on five headliners on every show that'll do like 15 minute sets. And then the up and comers like us would have no problem promoting it because we were excited to be on a show where people would come out and they're going to see all of our favorite comedians. And so we created a kind of a new template in New York City for shows that it wasn't a new talent. It was a pro show. So Character Flawed started out was once a month. Before you know, it was six to eight shows a month. We did it at Stand Up New York in Danger Fields. It grossed over a million dollars in like eight years at Stand Up New York in in food and drink sales. And it was a juggernaut. And uh, it was all the way up until COVID. We had the show at Danger Fields about six times a month. Thursdays and Saturdays. And it would, it, we had, we would have more at a five o'clock dinner show on a Saturday than their eight and ten thirty shows. Incredible. So what do you, what do you think drove that success? Why was it so yeah. popular? I think because comics, everyone got behind it because everyone was so motivated to be on a show that they were proud of and okay. their friends were coming, like they were feeling guilt free to feel like they, Oh, please come. I'm on this. You know, they were like, Hey, I'm look at the people I'm on the show with, you know? Right. Um, so it became and, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once it was successful, yeah. comics yeah. wanted to be on it. 
once yeah. it was a good show, comics wanted to ask their friends to come. Yeah. So it yeah. remained a good show because there was a lively audience. Yeah. And lo and behold, we do the show now uh, once a month in New Jersey because New York was shut down for a long time. So we're going to go back to New York. But right now we do the show once a month in New Jersey and every show uh, has been selling out, you know, which is like awesome. 120 seats, 115. It's wow. small. It's intimate. And, uh, and hopefully knock on wood, it, you know, keeps going. So that's incredible. How do you market that show? these days yeah so like so yeah we're always trying to like stay um on the on the cutting edge of of what a 20 year old wants you know yeah. and it's like i'll go on you know it's like tiktok twitter instagram facebook uh i'll do a tiktok live and i'll promote it and um, i just think you have to cover every one of your bases and just it's a lot of work and i think a lot of people that have shows you, you have to be willing and able to put a tremendous amount of work to start building the brand. And, and lo and behold, this show is 23 years in and wow. um, it's, I can't believe it. 23 years. And it's been, uh, it's what, been what month. What's that? Is the, what month is the anniversary? Oh, well, God, I'm trying to think when we started, I probably started yeah. in the spring. So it'll probably be 23 years, like probably in May. Yeah, that's so your 20th anniversary was right oh, yeah. at the start of COVID. COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Everything was shut down. What a disaster. Yeah, oh, yeah. no. Because <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask, what did you do for your 20th? It must have yeah. been yeah. You know, a big blowout. Yeah, <laughs> I, I went to yeah, I went to a 24-hour emergency room to see if I was coughing. <laughs> uh, but like if you ever come to New Jersey or you're coming up this way, like you if you let me know like a month out, would we'll totally you know get you on the show. Sure. So. Yeah, oh that's that's wonderful. Um, so do you are you able to tell which of so basically your answer to how do you market it is through every avenue possible? You're you're yeah. using all these different streams to to promote yeah. the show. Can yeah. you tell which ones are successful? Well, I think um how do you I tell? Yeah. Um, well, like for TikTok, um, I think the TikTok's been doing very well for me. So um, on the lives, I try to go on every day or every other day. And I go on is, you know, I went on there doing Donald Trump because people knew me from doing Donald Trump on Comedy Central. So I, I created the channel just to do Donald Trump to create getting work out of it. Um, and lo and behold, I've gotten a tremendous amount of of gigs off of TikTok, doing private parties at corporate events. And then I, so I go on there as the character, but I also go on as me to reach out to all these people to tell them, here's my upcoming schedule. So I feel like TikTok has been the best for me, but Instagram too, you know, I would say those okay. are the best. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and do you do anything special? Do you feel like your show is different in terms of production quality in any way? Sound, lighting, stage, like the actual environment? What do you I think, think is important for showrunners? Yeah, I, I think for, for comedians, we could probably all agree that you just, you know, comedy is a very intimate, you know, art. You know, it's very important for people to be, uh, you know, I like an intimate club. I don't like it too big. I think 130 seats or less is nice. I, you know, when you, when I record a special, which I'm planning on doing, I want it to be in a small club, like a Kazi's in Virginia, like small, intimate, you're right on top of them. They're very engaged. Um, you know, it's unlike music. You could be a mile away on a, you know, on a green in your town, you know, the village green and you can enjoy it. But with comedy, it is a conversation, right? Yeah. Um, and and it, it, you really need to feed, feed off their energy. And I love doing crowd work. I'm a guy that likes to, I'm a kind of a free form comic. I have material, but I also love to incorporate the audience in, in a very unique way through my comedic sensibility, not, not in a hacky way, but I feel yeah. like I love being in the moment with an audience because you never know where it's going to go. And I think they appreciate it because right. it's kind of like this show is just for you. Yeah. Well, it's, it, yeah, you definitely get it, the best audience reaction when the audience realizes that this is just for them. This is never happening again. This is very yeah. specific yeah. to this moment. Yeah, it is. And and when you're kind of, kind, I feel like audiences kind of like when you go off script yeah. because they see that you don't know where it's going and they really appreciate that. It reminds me of like, I remember going to see Van Halen when I was like 12 with my friends and David Lee Roth would look up into the rafters in our section. And I'm like, is he 
freaking looking at me? Is he didn't <laughs> see me? And I'm like, meanwhile, there's like eight zillion people in our section. Right. And he would look up there and then just tell a little story while looking up at us. And you're like, that was for us. Like he's talking yeah. about New Haven, Connecticut right now. Right. And I really feel like personalizing it. It's all about, I don't know, for me, it's like, I always feel connected to a comedian with their material and also feeling like they're in the moment and they're not just up there going, Oh, I have to be here tonight. Here, here's the jokes, bang, 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 you know, and they right. just push the button. I, I, you know, you kind of resent that because you want to, they're excited to come out. It's they're paying for it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Have you ever, speaking of Van Halen and big concert experiences, have you ever said the wrong city name on stage or town name? I've said the wrong state. Yeah, I've said the wrong club, the wrong state. I, this happened to me for the first time ever this weekend. I, I said the wrong place. Oh, we did. I yeah. the other night I was doing. Uh, um, I think I was doing a corporate event as Trump, and I was in Pennsylvania. I was in Indiana, and I said, "So great to be here in Pennsylvania." Like I was, and then I turned it around. I said, "Ah, right. That's what Joe Biden would say." Like I said. <laughs> But but uh, yeah oh yeah I've done that I've I've had to introduce comics I remember emceeing, and I went up and I used to be so petrified I would write my notes on my hand, and and I'd always write the other comedian the headliner whoever I had to introduce would be on my arm, I was so nervous that I would forget who they were and yeah. one time I did it was smudged and I and his <laughs> name was like I don't even remember but his first name was like Glenn so and so and I could Glenn was completely so I would just like <laughs> give it up for. Mr. So and so, <laughs> and the guy was like, Mr. So and so. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's I'm crazy! So All right, <laughs> let's transition into some road stories. Uh, sure. you, got, you got some good road stories for me? Yeah, two horrible things that you have humiliated me and close put me very closely into therapy and closely into med being medicated. And 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 it's not even. They're not even funny. They're so horrible. So I'll share with your audience, and I, and we all have these. So there's two that stand out. One is I was auditioning for the Borgata in Atlantic City. And the guy calls me up who was an ex-boxer from Brooklyn. His name was Ray Garvey. Very teddy bear. But if you didn't know him, he was frightening. Big, menacing. Hey, how you doing? How are you? So this guy, Vic D. Potato, if you know Vic D. Potato, he's like, hey, I, I recommended you. He, I told him you're funny. You're going to go down and audition. I'm like, all right, great. So I call this guy, Ray. He's like, yeah, he told me if you're funny, the Bono. So you come down on a Tuesday night, Borgata. It's going to be all old people. It's going to be about 500 people. They're all like in their 90s. You know, they come in on the buses. But I want to see what you do. So you come down, you do like a guest spot. All right. So that day I'm getting in the car. You know, you always learn as you get older in the business, you know, get there early, prepare. Of course, you know, I'm in traffic. It's three hours from New Jersey to, you know, New York to New Jersey. I get down there and the traffic was so horrific. It was literally, I had 15 minutes before the show, 15. I'm unshaven, didn't change, haven't eaten, exhausted, OCD, like through the roof. And I get down there, I rush down there, I'm wearing khakis and the guy goes, hey, how you doing? He's like, what's your name? Oh, uh, it's Bob DeBono. Vic told me to, oh yeah, 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 you're auditioning. Yeah, yeah, all right, great. So what are you, you're not wearing a suit. All right, you're in khakis. All right, that's okay. All right, get, go over there, get ready. All right. Yeah, he didn't tell me. That. All right. So, okay. Okay. So I go over there and, he, and I go, oh, by the way, when, I know I'm auditioning, Ray. When am I going up like later or are you going to let me know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll let you know. The MC will let me know. No, there's no MC. Oh, there's no MC. Oh, okay. So I go on middle. No, you're up first. Oh, okay. Sure. I'll, I'll go up first. Okay. So now I'm like, oh my God, I'm in a panic. I'm no MC. I'm going up first auditioning, right? And I have, I thought I'd have time to go over my notes, right? Yeah. I go to the bathroom and I'm like a wreck. And I'm thinking I've never performed for people in their 80s. 12 minute guest spot, no MC. I'm walking out cold and I'm in there and I'm going to the bathroom and I'm peeing in this giant, like fancy, like porcelain bathroom. And after, after like 30 seconds, I'm just like trying to think like, what the hell am I going to talk about? I, should I do like Archie Bunker? Like, I don't know. These people are 90. And I'm going to the bathroom and I, I was almost done peeing. And at, at one point I realized I don't hear any sound in, in the toilet. Like I don't hear any water, nothing splashing. I was going in my own pants. Oh, Jesus. My belt buckle was in the way, diverting the stream 
and it was I was going into my khakis that were like around my ankles, and I'm drenched. Yeah. And I was and people say, well, like a little spot. I'm like spot. I was almost done. Like <laughs> I was. It looked like I was thrown into a pool. <laughs> one leg was drenched, and my crotch was drenched, and the other one was completely dry. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh my god, freak! Oh my, what am I? What am I? Oh sh. So I walk out and he's, they're all like, it's very, you know, Borgata, five minutes of showtime, please get ready. Take your, take your, you know, take your marks, take your marks. There's a giant curtain, the music's playing. And I walk, I, I kind of like tried to walk by him really fast and he's on the phone. He's like, yeah, tell him you, you, t whoa, 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 hang on. Oh, yeah. what happened to you? Hang on. What the hell happened to you? You, you drenched. Holy, hey, Richie, the guy peed his pants. I no opening act. He just peed his pants. No, no, no. I didn't pee my pants. I, 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 I mean, I did. I wasn't my. You're nervous. You kid. You're nervous. No, I'm not nervous. I'm fu I wasn't paying. I was looking around. He's like, "Well, you got to go on." I go, "I can't go on. I'm drenched." He goes, "No, you got to go on. You got to go up first. Go like I go, "Ray, please. I, I, jeans up in the room. Let me run. No, you got to go on." So now he's like, "I got to make the announcement. You're on. Here we go. We're starting in two minutes." He leaves the room. I'm like looking at the other guy, Richie Minervini. I don't know if you know who that is. Richie Minervini's throwing napkins at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wipe it down. Wipe it down. I'm, I'm <laughs> my pants. And then from the other room, I just the engine. One of the sound engineers comes in. Go ahead, get your mark. Get your mark. I'm a nervous wreck. I walk over, and all of a sudden, I hear the you know the music. Bah, 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 Borgata, welcome to Borgata Comedy Club. We enjoy our show tonight. And then he comes on the back mic. He's like, "All right, your first act tonight. You may have seen him. He's from New York City. Funny kid, Bobby P. P. De Bono." <laughs> and I went up, and I for twelve minutes, I completely bombed. Oh. Uh, people were looking at me, looking at my pants, looking up, looking at my pants. Old people like confused. <laughs> and I died. Uh, and the guy, he's gone. He passed away from cancer. And he would call me from his bed in the hospital when he was medicated. Out of nowhere, I'd get like a 609. I'm like, and I'd, hello? He's like a year, two, two, two years later. Hello? Yeah. Hey, Pete the Tabaro, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you going to come to my room and shit on it? Shit on the floor? <laughs> you have a new closer for me? going to come shit on the floor? <laughs> so that was That was one. Didn't go. I did get into the club, but I didn't go back for like four years. Uh, and I, now I work there, thankfully, knock on wood, you know, twice a year maybe. And, yeah. and I love it. But that was a bad one. The other bad one, do we have time for this? Uh, we got a couple minutes. I walk, I go to a Pennsylvania, Allentown. It's a hotel, Ramada Inn, poor, most poorly set up club I've ever seen in my life. It's like, it's not a club, you know, it's like restaurant over here bar over there and they just slap down like a stage right in the middle in front of you is a wall so there's the restaurant there's the bar i'm thinking why don't they just pick a room and put it in there right, right. they put it right, they wanted to maximize seats so you're facing a wall and then you do this or you do that so i go in there and and i was the feature first time featuring i'm nervous the booker's like yeah let me see what you do they all sound the same yeah <laughs> let me see what you get the same accent it could be the same guy and I go in there, and uh, the, the there's a the, I was like, who's the headliner? The guy comes down, doesn't talk to anybody. He's in a tuxedo, bow tie, you know, old, older gentleman. I'm like, oh, he doesn't even say a word to us. All right. So I look on the stage. It's this little tiny stage, and on the stage there is a a, a giant table with a little tarp over it, with like a magic hat and a cane. I'm like, there must have been like a kids show earlier in the day, and they didn't even break it down. We got to stand in front of this shit. <laughs> who does that so no one says a word mc goes up stands in front of it he's bombing they're yelling at him get off this thing. bikers hey shut up shut you up. they're throwing food at him it's it's like very contentious i gotta go up headliner doesn't say a word to me tuxedo i look over him doesn't say a word all right I'm, there's nowhere to stand i'll just all stand in front of this get up of all this crap so i go up there five minutes in i'm bombing no no, no one's listening I see all this stuff behind me. I have an improv background. I'm like, well, let me try. At this point, who cares? I grab the right. little hat. I put the hat on. I'm doing Ozzy. I go, well, yo, 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 I try to I tell Pennsylvania. And then I'm doing like Nicholson, like old impressions. You realize that I work. You like to be interrupted when you're dancing around. And I'm just doing silly voices. I'm just doing anything to get them to laugh. 
And now they're kind of chuckling because they're like, this guy's nuts. You know, this kid's <laughs> like totally, I got the cane. I pull the hat out. A bird flies out of the hat, flying around the room. <laughs> and now I'm kind of doing well. And after 15 minutes, I'm like, I'm kind, they kind of love me. So I do my 20. I get off. I walk over. Crowd's clapping because they're like, this kid really tried. I'm thinking this guy's going to be really proud of me. I got the crowd going. I look over. He's purple. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? What the <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't go over 20 minutes. <clears throat> they're great. They're, they're going to love you. 20 minutes. They're great. I got him going. You're going to kill. He's like, no, I'm not going to kill you, idiot. You just did my stuff. <laughs> I'm like, that's yours? And then the, he, he's as he's walking up, the crowd's getting nervous. He's screaming at me. And now they're turning on him. <laughs> and they're introducing him, going, here he, here he is. You love him. You need him. The magic of Tommy O'Connell. <laughs> and the booker comes over. He goes, I don't know what this kid's guy's going to do. You just did the closer with the bird. The bird's over there now. <laughs> That's story. incredible. Not even dramatized. True. Yeah. All the way through. I love it, Bob. I love it. Allentown, cool? Pennsylvania, everybody. Can you believe I'm in this dumb this business still? How am I, <laughs> how am I not thrown out of it? It's so fun. That's why we do it. All right. This has been Always Book and Comedy with Bob DeBono from New Jersey. I'm Mark Masters. We'll see everybody next time. Thanks for being here. Let's see if we can figure out how to close.